Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Here at Cabinets HR, we're currently running a crowdfunding campaign on the Indiegogo camp platform. Please donate and share our link at https cabinetshr.co slash crowdfunding. Our guest today is Josh Tenyas. Josh, you ready to be great today? I'm ready. Josh is, co is the co-founder and the software engineer behind Card, Card Center. He's been developing robust web-based software for over a decade. His diverse expertise and attention to detail have driven the technical vision and strategy behind Card Center. Josh is a graduate of the Jacobs School of Engineer at the University of California, San Diego, and an eight-year U.S. Navy veteran. Josh, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. So, Josh... You're in, I believe, Billings, Montana, correct? That's right. So probably not the first place people think about when thinking about tech startups. So can you talk about some of the challenges and maybe like the advantages of being like in Billings, building your company? Yeah. Uh, I tell you what, it, it is definitely not the first place that people think of uh, when they think of tech. Um, and there's definitely advantages and disadvantages. Um, the the disadvantages, obviously, is is that we don't have the venture capital infrastructure here. Um, we don't have a lot of infrastructure on the capital side to support, uh, you know, high risk sort of tech startups um, of any stage. It does exist. It's just not like Silicon Valley where you can, you know, walk walk down the street and knock on 20, 20 VC doors. Um, you know, and, and it's harder to find people here too, because we don't have a, um, we don't have a robust university system that's pumping out software engineers. Uh, you, you can get those degrees in the state, but they're not in every city. Um, and there's just fewer people to go around basically. Um, but, but there's advantages too, because the advantage from my perspective is that I get to not only start my tech company here, um, but be a part of the growing ecosystem of entrepreneurs in the state. That is kind of a new and um, interesting, it's a new and interesting space to be as me and other tech companies uh, kind of start popping up out of the woodworks basically. And it's taken intentional effort, I think on the, the entrepreneurs who are here as part to kind of help build that community. And that's exciting. And that's not something that you get to participate in, you know, in some place like Boulder, Colorado, or or San Francisco. So is Montana that's your there because I'm guessing that's your home state. Yeah, so this is my home state. I uh, I grew up here and um, went to high school here and and left when I joined the Navy. And you just went back home after you got out of the out of the, out of the if you got out of the Navy. Yeah, I got out of the Navy. Um, and I worked down in San Diego for a little bit and went to school in San Diego, got my degree. Um, and when I finished that, I, I looked around and all my friends who are still in the military uh, were PCSing out of, out of state or moving to another state or, you know, moving someplace else. And everybody that I went to school with was moving up to Silicon Valley to get their big tech company jobs. Um, so I was looking around and I thought, well, you know, now might be a good time to try moving back home and, and seeing how that works for a while. And, you know, here I am, I moved back in, in 2015. So almost six years ago. About six years. Yeah. What, what does it mean to develop software? What does actually, does that mean? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, developing software, I guess is it's half half tech, half creative art, I think. Um, it, it's about clearly defining the, the problem that you're solving and producing a solution in code that is effective and enjoyable to use. That's how I kind of look at it. So what does it mean to develop? So it means perceiving the problem, documenting it properly and really understanding it outlining the solution and then implementing it um, in code and design. 
So Josh, it seems like a, a lot, you know, a lot of software developers, they start tech startups, whatever. And it seems like a, some of them, not a lot of them, like they'll build this great product. Then a lot of time the product, but spend no time marketing, right? They build this great product. No yeah. one wants it. How right. do you, how do you keep software developers from quote unquote wasting their time doing this and like actually like being more balanced? Yeah. So, um, I think it actually starts before that software developers have a wonderful uh, skill, most of them in finding problems for their solution <laughs> instead of uh, building a solution for, let's see. Yeah. It's a, it's a solution in search of a problem. So that that's, that's typically what they end up doing. They end up building a solution and then looking for the problem that it solves instead of the other way around. Um, so it's about first understanding the problem and how big that problem is and how many people are affected by it. And then, and then building the solution to that particular problem. And then after you have the solution or, or ideally while you're building the solution, you're talking to the people that have the problem that your product solves so that your market is developing while your solution is developing. Did it, I don't know if that made, makes any sense at all. <laughs> it, it does, it does. Yeah. And, and, and then reaching out to that same market, um, you know, when your solution is ready and you're, and you're ready to scale uh, to, to build your customer base. Uh, but, but marketing in and of itself is a totally, completely independent problem space from software development. And, and I would say, you know, perpendicular to the, the thought process and the, because from a software engineer's perspective, you look at a problem, you know, write, write code to solve it. Um, and it's predictable and deterministic. In the marketing space, it's far less so. It's far more experimentation, you know, developing a hypothesis and, and testing that hypothesis and, and iterating on that process until you find the right messaging that works to reach the audience that you're targeting. And sometimes develop, discovering that the audience that you thought would be the best fit turns out isn't the best fit. Uh, and so there's, there's pivoting involved sometimes too. And that I think goes against the traditional thought processes that software engineers have when they approach their software problem. Josh, so like with a software developer, they're, they're pretty much like they have a full-time job. That full-time job is not really going to give them time on the job to like craft, to like, you know, continue their craft and like keep up to date with everything. How much of the challenge is it for a software developer to keep up to date with everything with all the changes going on constantly? In, uh, in the world of tech? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think if you have a good job, um, that, that should be part of your job. So if you have, if you have a good employer, who's, um, you know, staying on top of air quotes, the times, uh, part of your job should be paying attention to how tech is evolving and, and, and iterating or enfolding that evolution into the product that you're working on. But if not, yeah, it's going to take, it's going to take time outside of your, your nine to five, um, to stay up to date. And, and I hope that that developers know that and are consistently doing that because if it comes time to switch to another role and another role or another job or another company, uh, you're going to need to be kind of up to date with the latest and greatest. Does it really matter what a, a new developer picks as their first language? Like it's going to be Python, we run Rails. Does that even matter? Um, so that's a great question. And I don't know if it, I don't know if it really has a clear cut answer. I, I think it depends on how you started developing software. Um, so a more traditional sort of process, you know, a more traditional path would be, uh, I'm going to go to school for computer science and I'm going to get a degree. Um, and through that process, at a good school, you're going to be introduced to a variety of different languages, and you're probably going to start with uh, lower-level languages and then end with 
experience in five or six or seven different languages. But if you are approaching it from a, I need to get a job and I want to develop some skills so that I can, so I can code, which would be um, kind of the, the, the coder side of the market, the, as opposed to the engineer, software engineer side of the market. If you, if you want to code, you want to find the, what languages and frameworks are hiring what's needed in the market and that's what you should that's what you should pick um so if if you want to get into the web development space learning c++ would be a pretty bad choice because there's not a lot of web development happening in c++ um so you know starting with javascript would be a good choice something along those lines if you wanted to get into machine learning you should start with python um, and develop your skills there. How long, uh, I mean, I know you don't have a good answer for this or, or like an exact answer, but is there a certain time, time frame where someone says, you know, I've been doing Python for two years. Um, I'm, I'm a, I'm a pretty good developer. Is there a, uh, like fixed length of time that you yeah. can look at and yeah. gauge? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I I think that somebody who has a lot of experience developing software in general could pick up Python and um, be a solid Python engineer, you know, less than a year maybe. Um, but if somebody said, I just started from scratch, from nothing, it, it would be it would be difficult to be really good at anything starting from scratch in a year, okay. I think. Um, but I but I but there are people. I would say, show me your GitHub repo. Let's see what you've done. Show me your GitHub account, I should say. Talk about GitHub. Can you talk about the points that like developers have in a GitHub, especially the ones like is that starting out? Yeah, it's your resume. <laughs> uh, it's not your resume, but it's the next thing that people might want to see after they look at your resume, um, because gauging how effective a a developer is is very difficult without actually having them complete some work or being able to look back in the past at work that they've already done. And GitHub is great or any, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be GitHub. It could be GitLab or, uh, or um, Bitbucket or something so that you could go back and look at some open source projects that they've maybe worked on or contributed to and seen the process behind how they develop that software. I think it's really enlightening. I've definitely done that. So Josh, can someone say, I have these characteristics, I'll probably be a, a pretty good software developer, or I have this characteristics, I probably won't be a good software developer. I I don't know if that's, I, I don't know, but. I would say that there are some characteristics that are uh, good predictors, like uh, an intense uh, enjoyment of solving problems and the and persistence and perseverance in solving those problems. Um, a lot of times in development, it is tackling something that you have never seen before it's a brand new sort of problem and there's often experimentation involved how do i solve this problem um a and then how do i how do i implement that solution in code and then you have to iterate on it until you get it right and there's often lots of failed attempts in between or discovering corner cases that you didn't think of. And so it takes a lot of persistence to do that without getting super frustrated along the way. So people who like solving problems and don't get really, really frustrated when they can't solve them right away, uh, are that's typically a trait that I see in successful engineers. Okay. So, you know, you know, every year, like new developers graduate either from like four-year colleges, coding counties, the KCB, and, you know, they need job experience. And then you have like this, a lot of startup people who need software developers. 
but it's yeah. like they're not connecting as much as they should be, right? So, so how, how can we get more junior developers connected with, with people who need them to build a company, so to speak? Oh, man. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, I feel like this is a big disconnect. Yeah. Um, you know, I I don't know if I really have a good answer. I, I think that You know what? What big tech does is they go to the schools and start recruiting engineers. And this is not for uh, coding boot camps. This is I, I didn't go to coding boot camp, but it, at four year universities, what Google and um, Microsoft and Facebook, what they do is they send recruiters to job fair events and um, classes and universities to start connecting with those developers early in their uh, academic career. And a lot of those developers will get internships. So they'll get that work experience at some company. And then when they graduate, they'll go get a job at one of the big tech companies. The startups I think is more difficult because oftentimes it's, it's more difficult for startups, depending on the amount of funding that they have to compete with the big companies. Um, they certainly don't have the resources typically if they're, if they're smaller. I mean, I, I imagine uh, after you reach some amount of funding or revenue that it's easier to go recruiting, but it, they could find it difficult to compete with the larger companies. But as far as, I don't know if there's a ton of like graduates from from universities that are having a hard time connecting with with jobs. I, I maybe I'm trailing off on this. The, so the question was, how do we connect boot camp graduates and or, uh, or, or basically how do you connect like the new developers, new experience with with a uh, tech startup yeah. and need people to build a company? Yeah, or at least get Gosh, some kind yeah. of MVP off the ground. So, so you, you have the new developers have no portfolio, yeah. GitHub, so to speak. Right. Well, so if you're a new developer, you should definitely have a GitHub. If, if you went to school or boot camp, you should you need to be working on that while you're while you're going to school. That's what that would be my advice to those those people in it's part of, in their education process. And then for the developers, I would say go out and find the startup community where, wherever you're at, and start meeting the founders in your city. So even here in Billings, Montana, we have a founders group of different companies and it would be awesome to have, uh, to start building those connections. It's really difficult for us to find people like at that stage here, cause we don't have many of them. Um, but that would be a great way for the person who needs experience developing software to get connected to some really early stage startups that really need help uh, working on their product especially at like that early stage. Um, and then for the, for the founders, what I've done is I've reached out to universities uh, in Montana and I said, hey, uh, when we've had an opening, I said, hey, uh, connect me with your, you know, hard charging, sharp computer science students because I want an intern or I want to hire somebody uh, before they graduate or at, right after they graduate. Um, and that's actually been more difficult than it sounds, at least for me in Montana. <laughs> uh, I, think, I doubt I think, that that's the case yeah. in other places. Yeah. So, so Josh, um, your company is going to be fundraising pretty soon, right? Or currently fundraising? Yeah. So we have fundraised and we might, we might do another round in, in 21. Um, but we're still working on the details. So two part question, how has been in Billings, Montana affected that? Like, did you have like, did you do everything in Silicon Valley? Was it all remote? And how did COVID um, affect that? Did it make it easier, so, better or harder? So we did attempt to raise um, early 2020 and we actually uh, started right before the market crashed. So that had a very negative impact on our ability to raise early in, in 2020. And so we, we scrapped our raise in 2020 um, instead of trying to fight the market, basically. Because at our stage, we were raising angel capital. There was a lot of people looking, watching their net worth 
plummet uh, due to the due to the market because of COVID in March of last year. Um, so that made it more difficult. We haven't traveled outside of the state. We've raised everything that we've raised has been um, from private investors or angel groups here in the state of Montana. And from how I understand the process and my experience is that's a very typical process. Typically, you'll start with whatever angel groups you're closest to. Um, and then if you're going to raise any money from outside of your geographic area, you're going to be syndicated or they're going to connect you um, with some other organized groups outside of the state. So, so that's typically how it works. We don't have, being in Montana, we don't have, and this is the case for many other states too, we're certainly not unique, but we don't have a lot of options as far as angel, organized angel capital or organized venture cap venture capital. Um, we don't, you know, you don't have the opportunity to pitch to four or five different groups or four or five different firms, um, which I think is the case in most states, California, you know, um, obviously being the exception, Colorado has quite a bit, Utah has quite a bit of capital, New York, um, but most states have, have few options. So I don't know if we're necessarily super unique um, in that respect. Um, but yeah, COVID definitely definitely had an impact in our attempted raise last year. So Josh, how did you, how did you get interested in software development and all this kind of stuff you're doing in tech? Was it during your Navy time, before you got joined the Navy or after the Navy? Or how do you come to all this? Um, so when I was probably 12 or 13 years old, I, I loved uh, playing computer games. And I played as it was a Star Wars game and I discovered that I could uh, modify the game by changing these configuration files and it was popular back then. And uh, that introduced me to the concept of programming and I just bought some books, you know, or my, I don't know, my mom bought them or my dad bought them or something and, and I started diving into the world of programming really early. So this is mid mid nineties. Um, started teaching myself just by reading programming books. Uh, and then I built my first website, I think in like 97 or 98. Um, so that's what got me interested. And I, and I, I just kind of knew then that I was going to go into software. So from your point of view is, is learning how to uh, become a software developer easier now was easier back then. Oh, uh, I think it's got to be easier now. There's a lot of resources now. Back then, there was books, you know, and I actually, my bookshelf behind me has a bunch of books from back when you learned to program by reading a book. And now um, all those resources are online and there's some live editor there so you can code and see the results right in front of you without all of this process of reading a book and getting something installed on your computer. There's a lot fewer barriers and, and there's more resources to learn. One thing I like about like, like software development is um, there's a, I can't remember his name, but this person I follow on, he has a YouTube channel and he just did like a live um, Python course on the right. And this guy made a comment, uh, hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm 75 years old. I can't believe I'm learning how to do Python at 75 years old, right? It's like there's no age limit either like young yeah. or old or whatever your case may be, demographic or whatever your case may be to learn how to code as long as you want to put in the, the time and effort, right? Right. And it and it definitely takes time and effort. It's not something that you're just going to pick up. But, but I think that's true about anything. I mean, you wouldn't expect to be really great at baking bread the first time around um, or, or painting or drawing or anything like that. It It's a skill that's learned over time uh, and and effort that you put into it. So Josh, you talked earlier about, you know, uh, bring on an intern from colleges. What do you look for when you bring on your own software developers for your company? Um, I look for somebody who is um, really interested in solving problems, who's self-motivated um, and who I think is going to be dependable. I think those are the most most important qualities. I also look for people who have some experience in the technology that I'm working with. That's um, a nice to have. 
Uh, but I would much rather spend time teaching somebody a particular tool set or giving them time to learn that tool set as long as they have an internal drive and motivation to learn it um, and to solve problems as they encounter them. Um, people who aren't motivated or, or have difficulty sh you know, showing up digitally or virtually now um, is it, really difficult to work with as opposed to somebody who's you know, there when they said they're going to be there and, and dive into problems when they encounter them. So Jeff, when you bring someone to your company, whether a software developer or marketing or whatever the case it would be, how long do you usually give them to like figure it out? Like how long do you say, okay, it's been X amount of months and this person still isn't performing to my expectations. Like how long do you like quote unquote give them to figure it out before you start? Okay. Maybe we need to move on from this person. Yeah. Um, I think, I think it varies on what exactly you expect them to do. Um, but I imagine that the, the number for us seems to be about three months, um, unless it's really clear that it's not going to work out. <laughs> and usually it's very clear at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. You're like, yeah, was definitely. That, there, there, what was I thinking? There have been, you know, three months has come and I'm like, why? <laughs> why did I not just believe myself two months ago? You know? <laughs> so talk about your time in the, in the Navy. Yeah, so I was in the Navy for eight years. Um, I was an electronics technician. I enlisted uh, right out of high school. Uh, I was on the USS Bunker Hill, where I was an air search radar and navigation equipment technician. And after that, I went to Com Third Fleet in Point on Point Loma in San Diego, and I worked under the three star fleet. Fleet Admiral, who is re responsible for all the units from the West Coast to the International Dateline, um, and I did that for four years. And there, I, there I did all kinds of communication stuff. I did all, all the communications for the Admiral and then the staff uh, at Third Fleet. So, Josh, how did being in the Navy help you become an entrepreneur? Like, what kind of skills did it give you? you know, really set you up for success? For what you're uh, doing per, now? Uh, Perseverance, <laughs> uh, just being able to being on, you know, you know, being an entrepreneur is, is hard. It's not a cakewalk and always having to do more with less, uh, always having to solve new problems that you've never encountered before, or even knew existed a month ago. <laughs> and all, I think all of those are are the same kinds of problems or the same class of problems that you encounter in the military. Um, so for me, being on the ship, uh, doing something that you don't really like, but you, but you gotta do it anyway, and learning how to push through those moments where things just aren't fun or you don't wanna be there, you don't wanna be doing it, but you have to. Um, there's a lot of moments like that in starting a company and being an entrepreneur or dealing with dealing with failures um, and being able to pick up and move on and not getting stuck in that sort of rut. I think that all of those, being able to handle all of those situations is things that the military teaches you by teaching you this mindset of, we're gonna get it done anyway. You know what I mean? Yes, yes, yeah. Um, I, and of course, I don't think most of us realize that we learned that in the military. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. think military definitely does a good job of like teaching you, like to get your teeth kicked in 10 times and putting them back in 11 times. Right. And yeah, like, like knowing when to pivot, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I definitely agree. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, just. The, I think that the difference is the big difference between being in the military and being an entrepreneur is that being in the military, you have a built-in, uh, you have a built-in support network. You know, you have the infrastructure there to support the mission that you're trying to accomplish. And being an entrepreneur is, you have to build that infrastructure. 
uh, it's not there for you. There might be um, there might be tools and things in place that you can utilize to help you along the way, but nothing is handed to you. And in the military, it's it's you you have your nothing is handed to you either. <laughs> um, but you know you you have a you have the expectations that you have to meet. And by the way, here's you know here's chief that's going to make sure that you that you meet those expectations. And if you have trouble along the way, he's going to be the one that will help you. And typically, that help involves correcting your <laughs> your uh, behavior or your actions or something like that. Um, it's not necessarily a hey, let's sit down and talk about it sort of sort of support. Um, but you have that sort of that built in where you don't have that uh, on the outside world. So, Josh, when did you know you want to be an entrepreneur? Was this, did you start like, did you start your company or you still in the Navy? They happened after the Navy. How did that process go? Yeah, I started, uh, I got out of the Navy in 2011. Uh, and I knew I wanted to start a company before I, before I even joined the Navy, probably. But it, I, it's kind of in my blood. My, um, my dad owned a couple of companies uh, growing up. So I was familiar with the whole run your own business process and what that looked like as a lifestyle. <laughs> um, so I knew I wanted to do it earlier. Um, and then I, I'd done consulting stuff. So one man show type businesses prior to starting Card Setter. Uh, and then in 2016 is when me and my co-founder uh, kind of you know, signed on the paper and, and actually started the business. Can you talk about the points of finding the right co-founder? Because a lot of people find the, find yeah. the wrong co-founder and, and all, it all goes downhill and there's like trouble and the newspapers, <laughs> all this kind of stuff. Like how, how do you recommend finding the right co-founder? Yeah. Because this uh, is basically I, like being married, right? It is like a marriage. Yeah. Like how do you go find a, how do you go find a, a, a spouse or a partner? I, I don't know. I don't know if there is a process, but it is a lot like a marriage. Uh, I'm not married, so I, I can't speak from like marriage experience, but I would assume. <laughs> and it might be, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's really hard. I don't know if I can give anybody any advice there. I, I can, I, I know that I knew my co-founder Jessica uh, for years before we started the company. Um, probably, let's see, probably two or three years. Um, and I think that that was really important, but then we faced all kinds of challenges after we started the company that those two or three years wouldn't have prepared me for just because just like being in, um, just like being in a relationship, um, you're going to encounter challenges all the time that you didn't see before. And regardless of your level of commitment, you're going to have to, uh, deal with them. Same thing with a business, business partner relationship. Oh. Talk about some pros and cons of being an entrepreneur from your point of view. Oh, man. Uh, the pros is you, you know, you, you don't have somebody else setting your hours. Uh, the cons are you typically have a lot of customers setting your hours. <laughs> and then the customers tend to set hours that uh, are more ridiculous than your boss would set. <laughs> um but there's a lot of freedom. So I, I would say freedom as a major pro, um, being able to control your own sort of destiny, I think is a major pro. There's no, there's no ceiling on the, on my income, right? Because I, I set that by the level of success and effort that I put into the company. I don't have to depend on somebody else giving me a raise or somebody or a job opening above me or the company doing really well and expanding or something like that. I, I control all of that. Um, the cons are that I control all of that. And so <laughs> I'm responsible for it. Uh, so if I don't get a raise, it's because I haven't expanded or grown the company enough, or I haven't um, seen all of the opportunities available to us. Um, so I don't know, I guess a lot of the pros and cons of this, I, are the same. I, I think that being an entrepreneur is not necessarily something that you choose to do because there are pros and cons. I think that being an entrepreneur is something that some people can't 
not do. It's like in their blood. They they have to do it. There's some weird internal drive that that pushes them to to build something on their own outside of a company. I guess there's entrepreneurs too, but it's a little bit different. So for me, it's it's something that I'm really driven to do beyond all pros and cons lists or rationality. So Josh, this is just your opinion. So, so how long should someone work on, on their, like their, their startup for they, for they like do something different? Like suppose someone has been working on some like, let's say a year, three years, six years, like he's being like, and they're like, we did not make any progress. Right. When should someone say, okay, I need to do something different. I mean, like not stop being an entrepreneur, maybe to, like grab this idea and what I'm doing, yeah. like, not even just a slight field, let's do something completely different. Like it, or so just keep on going until they exhaust all resources. Yeah. Um, I think that it depends on the amount of traction that you have. Uh, it depends on it, if there's any hope whatsoever. Um, and, I, and I think that it would be really smart to kind of set out your your success criteria and your failure criteria ahead of time. So when you, when you go into starting a company or when you go into a, a pivot or something in a company that you're running, what does success look like and how long is it going to take to get there? And what does failure look like? And when can I, how do I recognize it? You know, when do I know that we've not succeeded? And that might help you determine it might be time to pivot or it might be time to close up shop. Um, I don't know if I'd put a time period on it. Because sometimes it takes a long time, especially in the software world, it takes time to develop pro develop the products, it takes time to test the products, it takes time to market the products. Um, and that's the assume you have a good like tech team behind you too, right? You might go through two or three different tech teams or, you know, yeah. an intern or maybe you have like a, a good tech person, but they have like um, an offer they can't refuse and have to leave you. Yeah. Know? All, all of which I've seen happen. Yeah. In those cases, it's especially hard. Um, we're lucky because I'm the I'm a technical co-founder, so I get to work on the on the product. We don't have to outsource that, thank God, because if we did, we wouldn't be here right now because the amount of time and effort and money that it would have taken to outsource it would not have been, we wouldn't, it wouldn't have been feasible to do that for us and our team. But other companies, yeah, I mean, if you're outsourcing tech, that can quickly take you to the point of non-viability because you will literally run out of resources before you can develop an MVP to launch and test. And, and that's an easy sort of case to find. Um, but again, I don't know if there's necessarily a timetable on when it's, you know, when you know that you should move on. Josh, so someone's been a tech company. So they like do everything manually and get customers and then build an MVP or should they build the MVP first and get, and get customers? Yeah. If you can, if you can run your company on an Excel spreadsheet or a notebook, you should do that. <laughs> even though it might, oh, even though it might yeah. suck, suck really bad, right? Oh, it will suck really bad. Yeah. But you should do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, there is so easy to invest a ton of resources into building the wrong product. So easy. And the market is the one that's going to, the market will tell you what is the right product. And you can survey potential customers all day long, but until somebody gives you their credit card number or writes a check, that's when you know that you have a product that people will spend money on because they are spending money on it. Yeah, right. Everyone's gonna say, "I love your product. The, the market needs it." Oh yeah, I'll get it. But then as soon as you have it in front of them, they're like, "Oh, um, oh, this is really nice. Good luck." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't know you would actually make yeah. this. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't realize. I mean, I would pay for it, but maybe like one tenth of what I told you I'd pay for it. Oh, I would I'd pay, pay for it. it earlier, but yeah. can, and if you add this or add that or do this, or yeah, do that feature yeah. stuff. Right. Um, uh, terrible. To absolutely uh, will kill your product. It will kill your company. Um, so, I think absolutely uh, running out of an Excel spreadsheet until you have to have a product. 
the the exceptions would be if you have a very um low requirement product i mean if you can if you can sit down and build your product with you know in a in a few weeks or a month or something like that and push that out to test that might be the exception but if you're looking at develop at at putting a significant amount of resources into something um but you're capable of testing the viability prior to investing those resources, you should definitely do that. But then it becomes a balancing act. Uh, it becomes a balancing act of you, you don't want to get to the point where you are spending all of your time managing all of your customers in an Excel spreadsheet, and now you don't have any time to actually develop the product that will allow you to scale. Um, so you have to, while you're growing customers in your Excel spreadsheet, you have to know when to stop uh, or have a plan in place to eventually migrate that Excel spreadsheet into your software product. And that doesn't work for everybody. Like for us, for instance, our, our product isn't spreadsheetable um, because Cardsetter runs people's websites, right? They build their website on Cardsetter, it runs their website. There's no way to kind of cheat that because they have to be able to actually run their website. And so we have, we had to have a product. We've gone through several product iterations and we've learned every single time um, at Variant, but it's all about knowing when you have the minimum amount of resources invested in order to determine if you have a good fit with your potential customers. Josh, what's been your experience with this? Like there's a lot of people who give advice to tech startups, whatever case you be. Some good, some bad. I, well, I think it's all a good attempt, but it might be that the own lens is right. And they're not really like serving the needs of tech startup founder that good. From your experience, have you got like, a lot of good advice from a good place or has it been some kind of like, okay, what are, this, what are they even trying to tell me right now? And how and how does someone even like pick and choose like the advice to follow and not follow, right? Yeah. Um, I think that it comes with experience. Uh, and a lot of times that comes from experience of, following maybe not good advice. Um, you, we definitely get a lot of advice, uh, some good, some bad. I, I don't, you know, two years ago, three years ago, could I tell good from bad? Uh, not until I tested it, you know? So I don't know if you can, I don't know if you can tell, you know, good from bad un until you actually kind of go through the exercise. But I think that it's the same for you. It's the same from the advice that you'll give yourself. Uh, you should come up with a test for some decision that you're going to make. How do I know when I succeed? How do I know when I fail? How do I know when this approach is helping me or hindering me? And what, what's the amount of resources that I have to invest to test it? And what's the probability in my in my opinion, of it succeeding. You have to weigh all those different pieces before you decide if you need to follow that advice. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Josh, can you talk about some of like some of the lessons learned you've learned by building your product and how have you have you made that process better? Yeah. Um so I've learned, I've learned so much. Uh, <laughs> let me see if I can narrow it down to, down to one thing. Um, well, I think one of the, one of the big things that I've learned developing a product is that you don't know for sure that people are going to uh, buy it and use it until they actually give you their credit card. So we've done a bunch of different pricing models and over the, you know, since we started in 16, I, we really actually started rolling out to customers in 17. Um, but we rolled out with, with different pricing models and we had to learn that the surveys and discussions that we have with potential customers were not accurate. Um, so from a product perspective, like we had to adjust what people were willing to pay for it. Like the resources that we could put into it depended on what they could pay. Um, I guess that's kind of maybe more along the uh, marketing line. What do you mean, like from product? Do you mean like the actual software piece, or just yeah, developing the, the, a product the, the, in the general? The actual software piece, actually. Oh, okay. Product itself. Yeah. 
I've learned that people are, are a lot more forgiving than you might expect. And that engineers that build the product are the, are the biggest critics. And it's really super valuable to get a product out the door and get feedback as soon as possible. That's been a really big lesson learned. Like we've, we've spent a lot of time, me um, being super critical and say, oh, we'll, let's not push this until it's ready. And then we push it. It turns out we should have invested resources maybe on some other feature in the product, as opposed to being super perfectionistic on a feature that didn't really matter that much. So Josh, what's, if you can, what's your internal process for deciding what feature goes next? Like, how do you do that? So at this point, we have a lot of feature requests from customers. Um, so that's a big driver. Um, how, how for us is the web space, how, how is, how is Google weighting websites? What is best practices in the web space? Uh, all of those play into the features that we choose to develop. Um, and also the pain points, what are the pain points that our customers are ex experiencing using our product right now and how can we eliminate those? And also, uh, what market do we want to drive into and gain more customers in? And what features do we need in order to be a, a viable choice for them? Josh, can you talk like in more detail about your company, like how, how it came about, the idea it, it sprung from? Sure, yeah. What, what your company is actually doing for people and what the, what's your vision for the company? Yeah, so... Card Center is ultimately a, it's a website platform. Um, it, it powers websites and uh, our customers or we build websites on Card Center. So it's a, basically it's a content management system. It's a replacement for WordPress or Squarespace or Wix or whatever. Um, the idea came about because me and my co-founder when we met were uh, working for a web agency, developing websites on WordPress. And we were building hundreds of WordPress websites over and over and over. Uh, and also my co-founder ran a events and things to do website. So it had a blog and it hosted thousands of events um, that had dates and times, you know, and places and things like that. And I developed on, on her website, Billings 365, and we kept running into the same sort of issues of she would want to, Jessica would want to uh, easily feature like a, a set of a set of blog posts about a specific topic right here on, on this page or reorganize things really easily on her end without having to get a developer involved. So there was this real lack of flexibility on the in WordPress that we were struggling to get around without having to invest develop, uh, developer time. And so we said, okay, well, wouldn't it be great if these features existed, uh, being able to really easily organize your content however you want, um, just dragging and dropping things anywhere on the page so you could pull in, suppose you have, um, suppose you have season one and season two and season three of your podcasts, and you want to pull together all of the episodes that talk about a particular topic and then throw all of those on a page without having to individually do it manually. Um, that's something that's not easily done in other website platforms, but that's something that card setter can do in like five seconds because we built that feature in. Uh, so that's where the idea came from. Um, and so we sat down in 2016 and started sketching out all those different ideas and all those different features and we started building it and finally launched our first version in 2017. But along the way, you know, we realized that it's also critically important from a website perspective to support easy migration. So if you're coming from WordPress, you need to be able to really easily get onto Card Setter. Um, so we built a WordPress migration tool that allows us to zip people's websites from WordPress right over to Card Setter. Um, and then for brand new websites, the blank slate problem was huge. Uh, people don't know where to start when it comes to building their website. 
And that's actually a problem that we're still working on solving. Uh, we've been building tech for over the last year to help solve that blank slate problem. Right now, what we do is we have a customer calls us up, say, oh, I want to get a website on Card Setter. We have a phone call with them and we design and get their website all set up and then hand it over to them so that they can add content, they can add their podcasts or add their videos or whatever. Um, so we have a setup fee involved to do that, which is really, which is still really, really low compared to an agency. Um, but we're building the tech in order to support people self onboarding. So they can just talk, talk to a chat bot, fill out information about their business, tell them, tell us what they are. And then everything happens automatically. Their website is put together automatically behind the scenes. That's kind of the process and, and what we do. So we're a website platform. And right now we help people uh, get up and running by doing the initial build and setup for them. And what, what's your vision for the company? Like to be like the, like they take dominant market share where you can work press and square space, all this kind of companies. Yeah, totally. That's the vision. Absolutely. Yeah. We want to be a, I want to compete with, with Squarespace. I mean, we're competing right now. So I want to compete on the, you know, hundred million dollar a year plus range of revenue. <laughs> That's the vision. So WordPress, you know, they have all these integrations and plugs like HubSpot, other companies. How, yeah. How does, that, how does that work for Card Setter? Yeah. So we don't support WordPress plugins. So that, that adds some limitation. However, uh, HubSpot, Salesforce and MailChimp and, um, you know, pick your, external provider for something. They also embed, they also work with Squarespace or Wix or Weebly or whatever. And so they also work with Card Setter because they'll, they have some sort of embed option or, or um, way of working with a website that's not necessarily WordPress. So we integrate with them using those other integration offerings that those companies have aside from the WordPress plugin. And the advantage to that is that you don't have to always be managing uh, plugin updates or worrying if you do up, update this plugin, is it gonna break my website? Uh, and, and we're also completely software as a service, so you don't have to run your card setter site on your own server. Uh, it's run on our server, so we keep everything up to date all the time. There's no worry about updating and then crashing your website or something like that. So for, for card setter, who's your like quote unquote perfect customer, so to speak? Yeah. Perfect customer is um, a small business, one or ten, one to 10 people, uh, ideally in the content creation space. So that's where our feature set truly shines. So that's um, bloggers or podcasters or content marketers or even small businesses that produce content about what they sell or make. Um, but we have a wide variety of customers, small to medium size, but our, our real, where we really shine is in the small business space, uh, specifically with content creators. And how do you get the word out about your company? Are you like doing a paid marketing plan? Is our word of mouth organic? Like how's that happening for you? So we partner with uh, small business organizations like uh, SCORE, for example. SCORE is a mentorship group for, uh, it's national mentorship group for small businesses. We do a lot of webinars for them. Um, and they're all, you know, non-marketing webinars. They're educational webinars. Like how do you, uh, how do you put your website together? What things do you need to think about uh, when you're planning your website? What's the best way to structure your content? Things like that. Uh, we also do um, partnerships with like boutique advertising and marketing companies that don't have website services in-house. So they partner with us to handle websites for their customers. And we do some direct outreach. So depending on where, um, so for instance, here in Montana, we will go through lists of businesses, find businesses who clearly need website help and call them up and say, Hey, we can help you with your website. Do you need, do you need help? Um, we do that. We would eventually like to scale out into digital marketing more. We've done uh, digital marketing, like on Facebook and Instagram with 
limited success due to limited capital. It takes a lot of money to run those kinds of ads. We'd like to scale into them eventually. Um, and then we, oh, we also do newsletter ads. So newsletters have actually been a really interesting space that we've started getting into. So there's all kinds of newsletters that go out in, you know, on all different topics and some of them feature um, ads at the bottom. And so we've tested putting ads on those newsletters and those have been pretty successful for us too. Josh, how does this work? Like you're in the United States, but some one of the ones the website will say in, um, we're saying French, right? And so the website has to be in French. How does that yeah. happen? Does it, does it something like automatically translate it to another language or something you have to do by yourself? How does that, how does that work? So, so how we would do that now, and I don't know if we've done any multi-language websites. I can't think of any off, off the top of my head, but if, but it's really easy. You just have the same page in multiple languages, uh, but at different URLs. There's all kinds of, uh, there's WordPress plugins out there that will give you like a translation of the same page in multiple different languages. And some of them are, are good because they develop, they create a separate page for that. The right way to do that, according to Google, the almighty Google, <laughs> is to have two separate URLs, one for English or language A and the other one for language B and so on and so forth. Um, so that they're distinct pages and distinct languages based on the, the user's preference. And then some of that can be automatically detected based on where they're coming from, or if they click a button for a translation or something like that. So Josh, what's your process of doing this? Like, how do you make sure you don't support um, websites that don't that don't uh, align with your values? So example, and this is a bad example. Like, I'm a big Dallas Cowboys fan, right? So I have a website company. I would never do a website for the Washington Redskins, right? So how do you like, <laughs> how do you make sure you don't like support a website or, or, or something, a platform that doesn't align with your values? Or, do you, or is it all, as long as they pay the money, is, you still support it? Yeah, so... Uh... I don't think that that's the answer. I don't think the answer is as long as they pay, it's fine. Um, I do think that it, it's okay for a corp corporation in general, not just us, but a corporation to have a set of values. Um, we have in our terms of service, the ability to terminate service for somebody um, for you know a, a variety of reasons. Uh, thankfully, we haven't actually had to handle that particular case yet. But I imagine as you grow that 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 becomes, um, you know, an issue, the chances of you running into something that you don't want to support as a customer grows with the number of customers that you have. Um, so that's not something that I, I can say that I, I know exactly how to handle that precisely. I imagine that it would be a difficult discussion to have for the first time. And then as you grow and you have 100,000 customers, it becomes a normal standard operating procedure that you follow when somebody has to be removed from your platform, but definitely not something to be enjoyed. Yeah. I think the challenge is like, you know, you do get a hundred thousand customers and like a website kind of like, you know, slips in, you don't know about and someone mm -hmm. else comes about uh, and someone calls you on like, Hey, why is this on yeah. your platform? What kind of company you have? And, I, and how do you like do the back the, the, what's going to call it control the, problem control you want to call it right right yeah um yeah what's the word for that yeah i i know how i i have actually seen this process happen on other platforms um and and it's really easy to outline some some particular examples in your terms of service like we don't support hate speech we don't we don't support um websites that condone violence or suggest violence and so on and so forth and it's really easy to say Send to send an email and say you violated our terms of service on this page for this reason, and you need to remove this part of your website or remove this content, or we'll have to take down your website. I mean, that's but that's another challenge, right? I mean, you do get a hundred thousand customers. I mean, yeah. How do you like you know like you, you can't go? I don't, I don't. Maybe there is. Maybe it's some some kind of automated thing where like it scans all yeah. your, your websites and gives you things and like does it exist? Probably not. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, sure. I mean, that might be something that we might have to build in the future. Um, for example, other other platforms somewhat rely on uh, other people reporting that particular website as something that offends them or whatever. And then they go and look at the website and see if it violates their terms of service. 
And if it does, then they go through that process. Um, but it would be relatively straightforward to develop a um, AI or machine learning backed algorithm that crawls every single page on the platform, runs it through your algorithm to determine if it potentially violates your terms of service. And then if it does push it over to a human moderator who could then look and make the judgment call. And that, that I imagine would be the process, but you certainly wouldn't be just like Facebook doesn't have people looking at every single post that goes up, but they have a set of automated processes that look at a particular post to determine if it might violate their terms of service and then shuffle it over to their moderation process. So Josh, obviously, you know, you're focused on being your company, but is there any, any tech out there that's really excites you right now? Uh, oh, so rust, the language really excites me. Um, that's really exciting. It's totally software engineer nerd stuff. Uh, <laughs> that really excites me. Um, GPT three is super cool, super amazing stuff. That's a uh, machine learning based, uh, language generation, text generation, uh, GPT two also is, is amazing. Those are two models for generating text or generating text. Uh, I think the AI and machine learning space in general, especially with deep neural networks, is a really fascinating space to watch right now. And, and I think that what's going to come out of that in the next 10 years is going to be amazing and totally change how businesses run and content is created. Josh, is there a difference or in any kind of way between building like a uh, building like a, we'll say a game for like PlayStation five or Xbox or Fortnite versus building like a quote unquote regular, uh, software program. Yeah. The difference is in the, there's a lot more artwork in a game. Uh, there's a ton of art that has to be generated to, uh, skin all these 3d models. And then also all the 3d models have to be created, which is art. Uh, and then the main difference from a programming perspective is the um, the rendering engine that you have to use and then all the physics that have to be, so the physics engine that you have to work with or implement in order to make your game work. And they're like Unreal Engine is one of them. And I, and I should preface all of this with saying, I am not a game engineer. So I'm, I'm just spewing probably nonsense. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's all kinds of physics and art and and uh, and the the 3D rendering. I mean, all of that is massively complicated on top of all the standard stuff that you have to build in for a game. So I would say that the the, the game is develop, developing games is way more complicated than just a standard application in most cases. Josh, your company named Card Setter is there any significance to that? Does it mean anything or is this just a name? Yeah, so we use the uh, card user interface component like or the UX pattern a lot. A card is like a rectangular user interface element that has a picture and some text and it's usually tappable or clickable. And you'll see cards on you know uh, Twitter and Facebook and Google uses cards all over the place. It's just a UI pattern that we use quite a bit and so we named our company after it. Also, cardsetter.com was available, and the name is trademarkable, which does matter when you're uh, founding a company. A yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing worse than having a name for a company and realizing that that's something, the co, .co or .io or someone has it somewhere. It's tough. Yeah, it's very tough. And and we wanted, you know, we wanted to have a .com because we thought that that would be, that would be great. And so it took us quite a, quite a while to actually nail down that name. It was, we started with something else, um, which, you know, the attorneys were like, no, that's not going to be very protectable. And so we had to rename it and that renaming process took quite a bit. So Josh, I understand you have something for our listeners today. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, um, we have a 20% discount if anybody wants to sign up for Card Setter uh, using the, the code Cavness HR, all caps. Or they can just email me. And, uh, and Josh, can you give us your social media links to include an email for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. So my email is josh at cardsetter.com. I'm Joshua Tenius, J O S H U A. 
T O E N Y E S at, uh, on Twitter, uh, on Facebook, you can just search card setter, uh, Instagram and search card setter and our teams. You can reach the whole team at team at card setter.com for email. And to our listener, we have the link to his gift and his social media on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetsxlblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your with your friends and your network. And don't forget to donate to the Kevin CHR crowdfunding campaign at https yes. slash crowdfunding. So Josh, um, kind of off topic, but let's throw pose to someone out there and the software developer, the intern trying to find the first job. How would they get your attention? I mean, mine is like, of course, they'd send an email, but what would they need to do to get on your radar? Like maybe get at least, maybe not get hired, at least get an interview with you. Like what's your process? What do they need to do to get your attention? What kind of things do you look for? Um, I love a great looking resume that shows attention to detail. Uh, and, and, you know, experience matters. Um, experience in the, in the space that I'm in. So I'm in the web space. I want to see some experience and interest in the web space. People who, um, there's all kinds of different developers. There's game developers, obviously. Uh, there's web developers. There's desktop app developers. So I'm really interested in people who are interested in developing on the web. That's what I look for. And then it, because of that, because a lot of that is visual, I like to see a little bit of, of attention to visual detail on a resume. That's what I like to see. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. So Josh, we're coming to the end of our talk. Can you give us some wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? Oh man, wisdom or advice. Uh, I, you know, my, uh, my word of the day for 2020 or word of the year for 2021 and the day, I guess, is uh, acceptance. It's all about breathing and accepting how difficult things can be and then persevering through them. Man, that's, that's something that I've, I learn and, and relearn every day. That's my wisdom. <laughs> Josh, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.